36 men have tried and 33 have failed. What happened to the three men who made it the farthest? Here's the untold truth about the Alcatraz escape. Number 9. Background on Alcatraz The Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was a maximum security federal prison on Alcatraz Island, around one and a quarter miles off the coast of San Francisco. Given its high security and the island's location in the San Francisco Bay, Alcatraz was believed to be escape-proof and America's strongest prison. Alcatraz was used to hold prisoners who caused trouble at other federal prisons. It housed roughly 1,500 federal inmates, including some of America's most infamous criminals. Al Capone and George Machine Gun Kelly are some examples. The three-story cell house had four main cell blocks, A block through D block, right in the center. The warden's office and visitation room were on one end of the building. The dining hall and kitchen areas were on the other side, along with the exercise yard. The prison cells typically measured 9 feet by 5 and 7 feet high. Each prisoner had their own cell, but they were primitive and lacked privacy. They were only outfitted with the bare necessities. Prisoners followed a strict daily routine and their whereabouts were known at all times. To give you an idea of how closely they checked on prisoners, a total of 13 official counts were made every 24 hours. Escape seemed almost impossible. Despite the odds, from 1934 until the prison was closed in 1963, 36 men tried 14 separate escapes. Nearly all were caught or didn't survive the attempt. However, the fate of three particular inmates remain a mystery to this day. Number 8. The Escapees Inmates Frank Morris and brothers John and Clarence Anglin were the prisoners who attempted the infamous 1962 prison break out of Alcatraz. Frank Lee Morris was orphaned at age 11 and spent most of his childhood in foster homes. He was convicted of his first crime at age 13, and by his late teens he had been arrested for crimes such as armed robbery. However, even with his criminal past, Morris was in the 98th percentile in intelligence. Supposedly, he had an IQ of a 133. Genius level is considered 140 and above. Escaping from Alcatraz actually wasn't his first escape. He escaped from the Louisiana State Penitentiary while serving time for bank robbery. He was caught again a year later, sent to Alcatraz in 1960. The Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, were born into a family of 13 children in Georgia. The brothers began robbing banks and other businesses as a team in the early 1950s. They targeted places that were closed to ensure that no one got injured. They claimed that they used a weapon only once during a bank heist with a toy gun. By the 1960s, both received sentences that brought them to Alcatraz. But how did the brothers and Frank Morris come together? They all had served time together at the United States Penitentiary in Atlanta. After repeated failed attempts to escape from the Atlanta facility, the brothers were transferred to Alcatraz. A fourth guy, Alan West, was also involved, although he didn't leave Alcatraz with the trio. West was serving his second term in Alcatraz. He knew John Anglin from prison in time together in Florida. The escape plan started to take shape in December of 1961, beginning with a collection of several old saw blades that West allegedly found in one of the utility corridors while cleaning. And that's why he was pulled into the escape. In later interviews, West would take credit for masterminding the whole thing. Number 7. The Plan While in Alcatraz, inmate Clarence Carnes became friends with Morris and told him about the access tunnel behind their cells. Morris used this information to develop the overall escape plan. They then all carefully planned the escape for eight months, leaving nothing to coincidence. Over the next six months, the men widened the ventilation ducts beneath their sinks using the saw blades discovered by West. They also used metal spoons smuggled in from the dining hall. Amazingly enough, they also made an electric drill improvised from the motor of a vacuum cleaner. They hid the noise of their work with the louder noise of Morris playing his accordion during music hour. That was in addition to all the noise of instruments during music hour. Yep, that's right, Alcatraz had a music hour. This was something new to the prison and a somewhat loosening of the extremely tight rules. Dozens of men simultaneously playing the accordion and other instruments was able to cover up the sound of drilling. Their progress was concealed by whatever they could find to cover the walls in their cells. Behind their cells was a common unguarded utility corridor. They made their way down this corridor and climbed to the roof of their cell block still inside the building where they set up a secret workshop. This was a hidden place where it was always empty and guards pretty much never went. But they would still take turns keeping watch for guards at night. They used a variety of stolen and donated materials to build and hide what they needed to escape. Number 6. The Raft 
The guys spent many weeks constructing an improvised inflatable raft along with life jackets. Swimming was just not an option with the conditions in the water surrounding Alcatraz. The raft and the jackets were made using material from more than 50 prison raincoats. Of course, all the materials were stolen. So how were they able to figure out how to make a life raft? The men had access to magazines, and it's believed that information from magazines, such as Popular Mechanics, helped the men with the construction. The rubber raincoats were held together with thread and contact cement. The seams were carefully stitched by hand and sealed by heat coming from steam pipes. They were able to inflate the raft with a concertina, which is pretty much like an accordion, ingeniously rigged to blow air into their raft. The raft came out to be around 6 feet by 14 feet, just enough room to hold all of them. They would typically take turns working on the raft beginning at 5.30 p.m. and stop just before 9 p.m. That was the final lights out count for the night. While they were working on the raft, they were also looking for a good way to get out of the actual building. That's because the ceiling was roughly 30 feet high. But by using a network of pipes, they were able to climb up the walls. They eventually pried open the ventilator at the top of the ventilation shaft. They kept it in place temporarily by fashioning a fake bolt out of soap. This mystery kind of reminds us of the mystery of why Michael Jackson owned so much crazy stuff. Find out more with this video. Number 5. The Escape The night of June 11, 1962 was when they decided to make their escape. They had finally made everything they needed, and everything was in place. From the service corridor, Morris and the Anglin brothers climbed into the ventilation shaft to the roof. Guards actually did hear a loud crash as they broke out of the ventilation shaft, but since nothing more was heard, they decided not to investigate. Come on, what could possibly be happening? People breaking out of a maximum security prison on an island? They descended 50 feet to the ground by sliding down a kitchen vent pipe and then climbed two 12-foot barbed wire perimeter fences. They were able to do all this hauling the life raft and stuff to inflate the raft. They decided to go to the northeast shoreline of Alcatraz near the island's power plant to inflate their raft. That spot was a blind spot in the prison's network of searchlights and gun towers. It's estimated that sometime after 10 p.m. they left toward Angel Island two miles to the north. But really, authorities really had no way to tell how much of a head start they had. And that was thanks to the crude plaster heads they had made. Up close, the heads obviously didn't look real at all. But from a few feet away, they did the job of looking lifelike over and over again when they were working in their workshop. The heads were ingeniously made out of a mixture of soap, toothpaste, concrete dust, and toilet paper. They were able to make them look somewhat realistic with paint from art supplies from prisoners. The hair they used were from the barbershop floor. For the actual bodies, they would just pile towels and clothes underneath their blankets. Number 4. Left Behind It was supposed to have been the four of them all escaping together, but only three guys showed up. What happened? Alan West had trouble opening his vent covering in his cell. He had used cement to cover up the crumbling concrete around the vent in his cell, but it had actually hardened too much. The other guys did try to kick open his vent cover, but it didn't work. They had to leave since they had limited time. By the time West managed to make the hole wider to escape, the other guys had already left on the raft. He escaped the building only to return to his cell around sunrise and go to sleep. He decided to tell investigators exactly what they all did though. He gave them a detailed description of the escape plan. In return, he didn't get punishment for his role in the escape. Number 3. What's the official story? The official story by the FBI is that they believe the men did not survive their escape attempt to Angel Island. The FBI and the Coast Guard combed the area and found several items that they believe belonged to the men. This included a paddle, a couple of life jackets, and a sealed plastic bag that belonged to the Anglin brothers with letters, photos, and addresses. Later, shreds of what's believed to be the raft were found washed up on a beach. Investigators thought that the high tides would have made it impossible for the three men to safely get to shore. Their bodies are assumed to have been swept out into the Pacific Ocean. Also, there were reports of a body spotted in the days after. The reports came from a Norwegian shipping freighter that claimed to see a body floating nearby. The body was never recovered, but it was assumed as more proof of the men not making it. Another reason to believe the men had drowned was the information West had given. The men had intended to steal a car and perform a robbery once they reached Angel Island. However, no robberies or stolen cars were reported in the days after their escape were made. The FBI's official line was that the raft broke up and sank at some point after having launched from Alcatraz. They then tried to swim for it, but most likely succumbed to hyperthermia and their bodies were quickly swept out to sea. After 17 years of searching for answers, the FBI decided to close the file in 1979. Number 2. What really happened? 
Well, the only people that really know for sure are the three escapees and whoever they told. Anyone else doesn't know for sure. Despite the official statements, a number of family members have come forward and have insisted that their relatives did survive that night. In 2011, Bud Morris, a man who claimed to be Frank Morris's cousin, came forward and said that he had previously delivered bribes to Alcatraz guards. He also claimed to have met Frank in a San Diego park shortly after the escape. His daughter claimed to have remembered being there as well, meeting with her, quote, father's friend, Frank. In 2012, two of the England sisters, along with two of their nephews, claimed to have received phone calls and Christmas cards from the brothers in December of 1962. Then, in a 2015 History Channel documentary, it was revealed that handwriting on some of the Christmas cards was found to match one of the brothers. One of the more popular theories is that they traveled to Brazil. A friend of the England brothers, Fred Breezy, claimed that he had met with them in Rio de Janeiro in 1975. He had even taken a photograph of them. Forensic experts concluded that the photograph was most likely of the Anglins, but come on, they're wearing sunglasses here, how can someone really be sure? Robert, another Anglin brother, told his family members that he had been in contact with the brothers until around 1987. Finally, a letter was posted to the San Francisco Police Department in 2018 by a person claiming to be John Anglin. It read in part, quote, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. He stated that he would turn himself in and return for a minimal prison sentence and treatment for his cancer. The letter was tested for fingerprints, DNA, and handwriting analysis. However, the results were inconclusive. There are two main theories in how they made it off the island. The first is that once they inflated their raft and life jackets, they paddled hard toward Angel Island. This aligns with the assumed physical evidence from the escape. Fellow prisoner Bob Shiblin asserted that he had been providing Clarence Anglin tide tables torn from newspapers thrown in the trash by the guards. This shows that they had at least some knowledge on the tide conditions. The Anglin brothers also grew up on the Tampa Bay, and the family members say the brothers were great swimmers. Supposedly, they understood the currents and general conditions of swimming in open water and the nature of swift ocean currents. Their success was predicated on several factors, but the most important one was the time they had entered the water. Too early, and they would have been swept to the sea. But if they timed it out using the tidal charts and entered the water between 11 p.m. and midnight, they could have survived without much effort. The second main theory suggested that they had planned to make their escape with help from a passenger ferry at a nearby dock. A 120-foot electrical wire was reported missing from that dock. It's been theorized that the men used the rope to attach themselves to the ferry and hitch a ride to the mainland. Then, a boat was waiting for them near the St. Francis Yacht Club and sped them to a distant harbor for safe passage out of San Francisco. After hearing of the escape, Robert Chechi, a reputable San Francisco police officer, contacted the FBI reporting that he had witnessed a suspicious boat in this very area. He's remained convinced he had witnessed activities linked to the escape. Number 1. What's the most likely truth? Most of the time, the right answer is the simplest answer. For every single piece of evidence or theory that suggests they did not make it is another piece of evidence making a compelling case for survival. There just simply isn't any definitive evidence on either side of the debate to close the case. A lack of evidence doesn't prove they died, nor does it prove they lived. The untold truth is that we'll never, ever know unless one of the men actually shows up today and is confirmed to be one of the escapees. Too much time has passed for any stories remembered to be actually accurate. Here are some of Alcatraz's most famous inmates. Number 11, Al Capone. Al Capone does not need an introduction. You know who this is. Legendary gangster and mafia boss Al Capone entered Alcatraz just 10 days after it opened. He made millions of dollars selling illegal liquor at the time, and police weren't able to catch him doing any crimes except for one. He actually would find reporters to brag about his exploits. At that time, he was making an estimated $100 million a year from all his different ventures. He was flashy in everything he did, from his suits to his Cadillac that was protected by 3,000 pounds of steel armor and bulletproof windows. Many people at the time saw him as a hero because he would give back to the poor through various charities. He once even opened a soup kitchen in Chicago. Government officials knew all about the things that he did, but they 
couldn't connect the crimes back to him. But the one major crime they were able to get him on was for tax evasion. Capone was first sent to the U.S. Penitentiary in Atlanta after his conviction. He served several years in Atlanta before being transferred to Alcatraz. The reason he was transferred was because authorities discovered that he was bribing prison guards and other inmates. He had convinced many guards to work for him, and his prison cell had plenty of expensive things that other prisoners didn't have access to. For example, he actually had carpet in his cell. His friends and family lived full-time in a nearby hotel, and each day he had visitors. At Alcatraz, the warden and guards were immune to his cash and influence. He received very little preferential treatment, and finally, his prison term was actually just like a prison term. He was forced to maintain several jobs during his time at Alcatraz. It was in Alcatraz that Al Capone finally felt that he was in prison. The only privileges he was given was permission to have a banjo and to play in the Alcatraz prison band. This was only after he had earned that privilege from his good behavior. Apparently, playing the banjo was the only thing that he found joy in. His time at Alcatraz was filled with bad health, and he spent the last year in Alcatraz at the prison's hospital. Because of his poor health, he was released, but he only lived for another eight years after. Number 10. Mickey Cohen. Meyer Harris Mickey Cohen actually was first training to be a professional boxer instead of a career criminal. He started by boxing in illegal boxing matches in Los Angeles. His first professional boxing match was on April 8, 1930 against Patsy Farr in Cleveland. His last fight was on May 14, 1933 against Baby Arzmazetti in Tijuana, Mexico. And that's when he started his life of crime in Chicago. His willingness to do whatever was necessary made him indispensable to Bugsy Siegel's Jewish mob. Under Siegel's tutelage, he helped Las Vegas gambling get off the ground. He rose up the ranks, privately eliminating anyone who stood in his way while publicly hobnobbing with Hollywood movie stars and running a string of legitimate businesses. He was highly successful in the underworld, and his career as a criminal was quite long. Cohen's financial indiscretions eventually allowed the feds to indict him, and he was sent to Alcatraz. Alcatraz was almost close to closing when Cohen made his two brief visits. Cohen actually served his time at Alcatraz in two parts. He was bailed out for six months in the middle of his prison term, being the only prisoner ever to be bailed out from Alcatraz. That fact is a testament to the far-reaching sway that Mickey Cohen held in political circles. When the prison closed in early 1963, he was transferred to Atlanta, where his luck finally ran out. Number 9. Robert Stroud Maybe the most famous of all Alcatraz inmates is Robert Stroud, who was nicknamed the Birdman of Alcatraz. Why was he nicknamed Birdman? Well, the answer is really straightforward. He became an ornithologist in prison because he started studying birds after being put in solitary confinement. There was even a movie loosely based on his life called Birdman of Alcatraz. Despite his love for birds, Stroud was one of the most dangerous inmates in Alcatraz. He frequently had outbursts that had happened out of nowhere. Stroud's first stint in prison was at Leavenworth Penitentiary. Over the course of Stroud's 30 years there, he developed an interest in birds. He was initially allowed to breed birds and maintain a lab inside two adjoining segregation cells. Authorities felt that it would be a productive use of his time. As a result of this privilege, Stroud wrote two books on canaries and their diseases after having raised nearly 300 birds in prison. He carefully studied their habits and physiology. He even developed and marketed medicines for various bird ailments. Stroud was able to make scientific observations that would later benefit research on canaries. However, here's a funny story. Prison officials discovered that some of the equipment he had requested to study birds was actually being used to make alcohol. He was subsequently transferred to Alcatraz in 1942, and he spent a total of 17 years there. At Alcatraz, he wasn't allowed to keep birds, but he instead wrote a book on the history of prisons and studied law. However, his nickname still stuck around in Alcatraz. Prisoners and guards both feared and hated Robert Stroud. The common knowledge was that, quote, Stroud loves birds and hates people. And that makes sense because he was diagnosed as a psychopath. When the movie Birdman of Alcatraz came out, many people begged for Stroud's release. However, that of course didn't happen. Former inmates of Alcatraz say that the real Stroud was far more sinister and dangerous than the fictionalized version of the Birdman portrayed on film. Number 8. Frank Morris Frank Morris was arguably the mastermind behind the most famous escape attempt from Alcatraz. Morris had a long history of being in and out of jail. He was abandoned by his parents as a kid, so he grew up in foster homes. 
He was convicted for his first crime at age 13, and by his late teens, he had already been arrested for armed robbery. However, it was his intelligence that made him stand out. Morris was in the 98th percentile in intelligence with an IQ of 133. He served time in Florida and Georgia, and he was actually able to escape from the Louisiana State Penitentiary while serving time for bank robbery. So the Alcatraz escape wasn't his first rodeo, but police found him a year later while he was committing a burglary. And that's when he was sent to Alcatraz. At Alcatraz, he quickly began plotting the elaborate escape with fellow inmates Alan West and brothers John and Clarence Anglin. They eventually attempted their escape in 1962 with all but Alan West successfully leaving Alcatraz. Alan West failed to escape because he got stuck trying to remove his vent in order to get behind the wall. Of course, there are various conspiracies on where any of them went after getting out of Alcatraz. No bodies were ever recovered. Number 7. The Anglin Brothers John and Clarence Anglin, or better known as the Anglin Brothers of THE famous escape attempt, were born into a big family with 13 children. Clarence was first caught breaking and entering when he was just 14 years old. By the early 1950s, John and Clarence began robbing banks and other businesses together as a team. Even though they did crime, the Anglin Brothers didn't believe in hurting anyone. When they robbed a business, they chose a time when the business was closed. They robbed banks with only toy guns, only for the effect. In 1958, John and Clarence robbed the Columbia Savings Bank building with fake guns. They both received 15 to 20 year sentences for their role. They served their first few years at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, and then they did time at Atlanta Penitentiary. The brothers were eventually transferred to Alcatraz because of repeated failed attempts to escape from the Atlanta facility. Guards at Alcatraz were warned that they should be kept separate because of their escape attempts. But because Alcatraz was believed to be so secure, they were still placed next to one another. And they happened to be placed next to probably the smartest guy in Alcatraz in Frank Morris. As part of their escape plan, they took on whatever necessary jobs they could in Alcatraz in order to get materials they needed. For example, they worked in the prison barber shop so that they could get hair for the fake heads. After years of planning, they successfully escaped the prison with Frank Morris and their bodies were never found. If you haven't watched our take on their escape attempt, be sure to watch this video. Number 6. Roy Gardner Roy Gardner was once America's most infamous prison escapee. He was the most famous escaped convict during the Roaring Twenties. Alcatraz was rebuilt from a military prison to a general federal prison in order to deal with criminal escapees exactly like Roy Gardner. Gardner is known as the last great American train robber. During his criminal career, he stole over $350,000 in cash and securities. He was a one-man bandit operating in the Midwest by robbing passengers and mail trains. However, what he was most famous for was his successful prison escape from McNeil Prison. That prison was supposedly the most secure prison in America before Alcatraz was built. He was able to escape by using two fellow inmates as decoys. He had convinced them that he had paid off the prison guards and they would be able to get away safely. Of course, that didn't happen. Gardner just wanted to not get all the attention himself during his escape attempt. He didn't really care whether the other two guys made it or not. Because of him being able to convince other inmates to join in his escape attempt, Gardner was able to get away with only a minor injury to his leg. He then swam to a neighboring island and stayed free for the next few months. But he became number one on the most wanted list at that time. He was recaptured several months later while attempting to rob a mail train and he was sentenced to an additional 25 years in prison. He did time at two more prisons, both of which he attempted to escape. This guy doesn't know the definition of quit. Finally, authorities smartened up. He was finally transferred to Alcatraz in 1934. At Alcatraz, he was feared as one of its most hardened inmates. In his final year of prison, Gardner planned an escape from Alcatraz with a fellow inmate, but he never saw it through because he was released on parole in 1936. Number 5. Alvin Creepy Carpus just like Machine Gun Kelly, Alvin Francis Carpus saw kidnapping as an easier way to make money. At that time, kidnapping wasn't a federal crime until after the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby. It was just more lucrative and safer to kidnap rich people than robbing banks. Alvin came to be known as Creepy by fellow gang members just because they thought he had a creepy grin. He was the brains behind the Barker Carpus gang because he supposedly had a photographic memory and was known as super smart by other criminals. The gang was known for their ruthlessness and longevity during the early 1930s. 
1933, the gang kidnapped William Ham, a millionaire Minnesota brewer. His ransom netted them $100,000. Shortly afterwards, they also abducted Minnesota banker Edward Bremer. That ransom brought them $200,000. But that kidnapping proved to be the beginning of their end. The father of Edward Bremer was a friend of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The FBI and local police bureaus decided to bring a stop to any type of kidnapping for ransom. The FBI organized a group of highly skilled agents called the Flying Squads that specialize in hunting down the leading public enemies. In 1934 alone, many gangsters met their end, such as John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, Charles Pretty Boy Floyd, and Tommy Carroll. However, not Carpus. He escaped from the police more than once. He wasn't arrested until 1936 when J. Edgar Hoover personally took him into custody. He was the last public enemy to be taken into custody. Carpets also had the honor of being the longest serving inmate at Alcatraz, serving 26 years. He even outlasted the prison itself, which closed in 1963. Carpus finished his time elsewhere and was deported to his native Canada after ultimately getting released from prison in 1969. Number four, Henry Young. Henry Young was one of the most infamous inmates to occupy a cell at Alcatraz. He caused nothing but trouble for the guards there, and that's what he wanted. For example, he had led a work strike and he consistently threw items at guards from his cell. He also attempted to escape Alcatraz with four other inmates in 1939. His time at Alcatraz inspired a movie called Murder in the First. However, what happened to the movie Henry was completely different with what actually happened to Henry in real life. He was held in the disciplinary segregation unit in the main cell house for a few months as punishment for the escape attempt, not three years in solitary confinement as the movie claimed. Around a year later, Young went ahead and let's call it, uh, took care of one of the inmates who had tried to escape with him. Young's trial led to questions about how the prison was run. While Young had always been considered unstable, his behavior became more bizarre as time went on. He would do such things as refusing to eat, or he would have intense bouts of laughing or crying. He became a religious zealot, claiming that the staff at Alcatraz were persecuting him. Prison authorities were baffled. Was he mentally disturbed or a genius at faking mental disorders? In 1948, Young was transferred from Alcatraz to the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners, Springfield, Missouri. He was later transferred to Washington State Penitentiary at Walla Walla. Young jumped parole in 1972 and after being released from Walla Walla, and since then, no one has seen or heard from him ever since. Number three, Arthur Doc Barker. Arthur Doc Barker was another member of the infamous Barker Carpus Gang, which was founded by his brother Fred Barker and Alvin Creepy Carpus, someone you just heard us talk about. Generally known as Doc, Arthur was typically called on for the action while Fred and Carpus were the brains of the gang's crimes. Remember the two wealthy St. Paul businessmen, William Ham and Edward Bremer? Barker was personally grabbed both Ham and Bremer during the kidnappings, intimidating them with his brutality. However, it was Barker who made a slip up that led to the gang's capture. Having collected the ransom for Bremer, Barker was driving him to the drop-off point. Along the way, he stopped to refuel. He removed a glove while he was holding the gas can. The discarded can was later recovered and Barker's fingerprints were identified. He was arrested and convicted of kidnapping in 1935 and by 1936, he was already sent to Alcatraz. Three years later, Barker was part of the inmates with Henry Young that attempted an escape from Alcatraz. They sawed through four sets of prison bars and concealed the cuts with putty. Eventually, they climbed over the high walls of the prison on a foggy night and escaped to the beach. The guards spotted them, and that's when things didn't go well for him. Barker didn't make it. Barker was often described as a dimwit and a drunk. However, fellow Alcatraz inmate Henry Young said that he was determined and ruthless, and that once he started doing something he wanted to do, nothing could stop him. Number two, Machine Gun Kelly. Machine Gun Kelly was born George Kelly Barnes Jr. But did you know that he attended college and he studied agriculture? Yeah. Kelly came from a good family, and he started his life on the straight and narrow path. But his life quickly changed with a marriage. That sudden marriage led him to drop out of school, and he got involved in bootlegging during Prohibition to make ends meet. Kelly didn't really hit the big time in crime until he met and married a more experienced criminal named Catherine Thorne. Catherine groomed her new husband for success by buying him a Thompson machine gun. She was the one who encouraged him to learn how to use it so he could make a bigger name for himself. His crimes and his nickname of Machine Gun Kelly spread. 
Even the FBI's wanted posters described him as an expert machine gunner, and he became one of the most famous criminals in the U.S. They were arrested after they made a mistake during their kidnapping of an Oklahoma oil tycoon named Charles Urschel. They were able to successfully secure the $200,000 ransom and return Urschel unharmed. However, Urschel had a great memory. Despite being blindfolded, he remembered vivid details of his kidnapping. He had noticed the sounds of oil pumps working in a nearby field, and he also noticed that a twin-engine airplane had flown directly overhead daily. That was valuable information that led police to Kelly and Thorne. They were convicted and sentenced to life. Kelly didn't make it any easier on himself after he bragged that he would break himself and his wife out of prison in time for Christmas. The authorities took him seriously and decided to ship him to Alcatraz where he'd spent a total of 17 years. The time he served was the era of the silence rule and considered the toughest years of the prison's history. Even though he had a fearsome sounding nickname, Kelly was actually a model inmate at Alcatraz. He was so well behaved that other inmates began to refer him as Pop Gun Kelly. Number one, James Whitey Bulger. James Whitey Bulger is arguably the most famous Alcatraz inmate for today's generation because of portrayals of him in recent Hollywood movies. Bulger began his career as a gang member in Boston in the early 1940s. Early in his criminal career, local police gave Bulger the nickname Whitey because of his blonde hair. He actually hated the name. He preferred to be called Jim, Jimmy, or even Boots. That last nickname came from his habit of wearing cowboy boots and his habit for hiding a switchblade in the boots. However, the nickname Whitey stuck. Bulger served his first serious prison sentence in Atlanta, the same prison where Capone and Gardner had also done time. He got to Alcatraz in 1959, only a few years before it would shut down. Bulger had said that his stay there was one of his best prison experiences. In a letter to Alcatraz historian Michael Esslinger, he stated, quote, if I could choose my epitaph on my tombstone, it would be, I'd rather be an Alcatraz. After he got out of Alcatraz, he became one of Boston's biggest crime bosses. He dominated the region in the 1970s and 80s with his illegal operations. In 1994, under investigation, Bulger went on the run. He remained free for another 16 years as he stayed on the FBI's most wanted list. In 2000, the FBI's Boston branch established a unit just to focus on finding Bulger. He ended up number one on the most wanted list after Osama bin Laden was taken care of. After searches through Europe, South America, and Asia, they found Bulger living under an alias in Santa Monica, California in 2011. He was 81 years old at the time of the arrest. He was convicted and sentenced to two consecutive life terms in late 2013. In 2018, he was transferred to the Hazleton Federal Penitentiary in West Virginia. But let's just say Bulger had a very unpleasant welcome. He was 89 years old and in a wheelchair when he went on to the next life. It was probably because of him being a federal informant in the past. Here's what being a prisoner in Alcatraz was like. Find out why it ended up closing. Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, or The Rock, was a maximum security federal prison on Alcatraz Island located roughly one and a quarter miles off the coast of San Francisco. The prison operated from August 1934 all the way until March 1963. That's almost 60 years ago. But why are people still fascinated with this prison despite being shut down for many years? It's because of its reputation of supposedly being an escape-proof prison. Given its high security and the island's location in the cold waters and strong currents of San Francisco Bay, it was believed that Alcatraz was America's strongest prison at the time. Alcatraz had been the site of a fort since the 1850s. The main prison building was built in 1910 to 1912 as an army military prison. The island became a federal prison in 1934 after the old buildings on the island were modernized and security increased. Alcatraz was home to some of America's most ruthless, such as Al Capone, George Machine Gun Kelly, Mickey Cohen, Whitey Bulger, and Alvin Creepy Carpus, who served more time at Alcatraz than any other inmate. Alcatraz wasn't for just any normal prisoner. It was used to hold prisoners who continuously caused troubles at other federal prisons. The convicts housed in Alcatraz were not necessarily prisoners who had committed the worst crimes. They were the convicts most in need of a so-called attitude adjustment. These were the guys with the worst behavior at other prisons, such as guys that bribed guards or guys that attempted escapes. A trip to Alcatraz was intended to get them to follow the rules so that they could eventually return to other federal prisons. On average, an inmate would spend about eight years at Alcatraz. 
there were only two men ever paroled directly from Alcatraz into the free world. Most of the prisoners would be taken back to other federal prisons. According to past correctional officers, once a convict arrived on Alcatraz, his first thoughts were on how to leave. A total of 36 prisoners made 14 escape attempts, with two men trying twice. Everyone that's tried to escape has been accounted for, except for five men. They're still listed as missing or presumed drowned. Alcatraz consisted of several big facilities on the island. The main cell house was built incorporating some parts of Fort Alcatraz's citadel. A new cell house was built from 1910 to 1912 on a budget of $250,000, a hefty amount of money at the time. The 500-foot-long concrete building was reputedly the longest concrete building in the world at the time. This building became the main cell house of the prison until its closure in 1963. Alcatraz Cell House was a corridor naming system based on major American streets and landmarks. Michigan Avenue was the corridor to the side of A Block, and Broadway was the central corridor where inmates would assemble. Times Square was an area that was just before inmates would enter the dining hall for their meals. Broadway separated Block B and Block C, and prisoners kept along this corridor had the least privacy in the prison. The corridor between Block C and the library was called Park Avenue. The corridor in D Block was named Sunset Strip. And no, none of the prison was as glamorous as these names. Inmates were entitled to food, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. Anything else was seen as a privilege. Everyone wore the same clothes, a blue shirt, gray pants, cotton long underwear, socks, and a blue handkerchief. When it comes to their appearances, it was mandatory for all prisoners to shave in their cells three times a week. Toilet paper, matches, soap, and cleanser were issued to the cells on Tuesdays and Saturdays. Pretty much everything else was considered contraband. Even money was not allowed. The bars, windows, and floors of the prison were cleaned on a daily basis. In earlier years, there was a strict code of silence. No one was allowed to talk to anyone at any time. By the 1950s, this rule had relaxed and talking was permitted in the cell house and the dining hall provided that the conversations were kept relatively low. Prisoners used to be woken up at 6.30 in the morning and sent to breakfast at 6.55. After returning to their cells from breakfast, inmates had to tidy their cell and place their trash outside at 7.30 a.m. when work shifts started. Working at the prison was considered a privilege for inmates. If an inmate is assigned a job, he had to accept that line of work. Of course, they weren't allowed to have any money in the prison. Instead, their earnings went into a prisoner's trust fund. Many of the better inmates were employed in the Model Industries Building and New Industries Building during the day. These prisoners actively involved in providing for the military and jobs such as sewing and woodwork. They also performed various maintenance chores around the prison. Smoking was another privilege that was permitted in the workplace providing there wasn't any hazardous conditions. Lunch was served at 11.20 in the morning followed by 30 minutes of downtime in the cell before returning to work until 4.15 in the afternoon. Dinner was served at 4.25, and the prisoners would then retire to their cells to be locked in for the night at 4.50. They got locked in before 5 in the afternoon. Lights off was at 9.30 at night. After locking in the prisoners for the night, six guards usually patrolled the four cell blocks. A total of 13 official counts were made throughout the day. In addition, shop foremen made their own verification counts. Sunday and holiday routines had their own schedules with time reserved for haircut, showers, clothing changes, and recreation. Many prisoners have compared their time at Alcatraz as the worst thing they've gone through. The hardest part for a lot of them was the never-changing routine. One former prison guard compared his prison job to being a zookeeper or a farmer. According to him, it felt like the prisoners were treated like animals. Because he was sending them to out to basically plow the fields during the day, and then he would round them up and feed them before locking them down for the night. That's one way of thinking about the situation. So how tough was this legendary security in Alcatraz? Well, when Alcatraz was built, the authorities took measures to strengthen the security of the prison cells to make Alcatraz, quote, escape proof. But they also wanted to improve the living conditions for the staff. Up-to-date technologies at the time for enhancing both security and comfort were added to the buildings. Guard towers were built outside at four strategic locations. Cells were rebuilt and fitted with tool-proof steel cell fronts and locking devices operated from control boxes. That way, a cell door could just be locked down immediately or all doors could be opened immediately. All windows were made covered with iron grills and the front door was made of solid steel virtually impossible for any prisoners to escape through. 
Electromagnetic metal detectors were placed at the entrances of the dining hall and workshops with remote-controlled tear gas canisters at appropriate locations. Who knew they had this tech back then? Old tunnels were also sealed up with concrete to avoid hiding and escaping. Substantial changes and improvements were made to the housing facilities for all the prison staff to live with their families. As you can imagine, the quality of the housing was relative to the rank. The warden had one of the biggest private properties on the island. Prisoners entering Alcatraz would undergo vigorous research and assessment. They're thoroughly checked out and evaluated when they first arrive. Obviously, they're checked for contraband and also their mental state. Once in, the security was kept extremely tight at all times. Guards kept up with constant checking of bars, doors, locks, and electrical fixtures. On top of that, prisoners were counted 13 times per day. If that wasn't enough, the ratio of prisoners to guards was the lowest of any American prison at the time. The island had many guard towers, most of which have since been demolished. There was always someone at the guard towers, and this is especially true when the prisoners were not locked in their cells. For example, there were guard towers overlooking each of the industrial buildings to ensure that inmates didn't try to escape during the workday shifts. The recreation yard and other parts of the prison had a 25-foot fence topped with barbed wire just in case someone tries to escape during free time. The corridors were regularly patrolled by guards with passing gates along them. The most heavily trafficked corridor was Broadway, the central corridor between Block B and C. Other prison staff also used the corridor daily, and not just the guards. This meant that there was always someone passing by. And check this out. At the end of each meal, which only lasted for 20 minutes, all of the forks, spoons, and knives were laid out on the table. Why? So guards can carefully count each one to make sure that no utensils have been taken as a potential weapon. One of the strangest routines has to be with the guards. They always held target practice right outside of the cell house. This was an almost nightly occurrence after the men were locked in their cells. Guards would go out and start shooting at dummies to practice in case they actually would have to take shots at someone attempting an escape. When the target practice happened at night, prisoners weren't able to sleep. Can you imagine trying to sleep with all those shots going on? And the guards always shot at dummies made in human likeness. Once the practice was done for the night, the dummies were left sprawled along the walkway. This was obviously done as a tactic in order to send a hard message to anyone that's thinking of attempting anything. Life at Alcatraz came with its challenges. The prison cells were purposefully designed so that none of them adjoined an outside wall. They typically each only had 45 square feet of space. They only had a tiny bed with a blanket, a desk, a sink, and a toilet on the back wall. An air vent covered by a metal grill was at the back of the cells these vents led into the utility corridors, this was useful for some prisoners. Find out about the real truth behind escaping from Alcatraz in this video. Prisoners had zero privacy using the bathrooms. Yeah, the stench in the prison had to be bad. Hot water faucets weren't installed until the early 60s, even though the prison closed in 1963. Alcatraz had a very strict regimen of rules and regulations, as well as the daily routine. Both the prisoners and the guards had to follow strict orders in order to make sure the prison ran smoothly and safely. Once a prisoner arrived at Alcatraz, he'd be given a copy of the rules to learn and follow. Cells were expected to be kept tidy and in good order. Inmates could actually request hot water and a mop to clean their cells. Inmates were allowed to write only one letter of not more than two pages each week. And that letter had to be a blood relative, so no one random. As for original incoming letters, they never actually get to see the original copy. All their mail was opened and they only received copies typed at the prison office. Visiting was also as regulated as you would think. No visitor was permitted to have any contact with an inmate. Each person was granted one visit per month and each visitation had to be approved directly by the warden. Rules dictated that inmates were not allowed to discuss current events or anything about prison life. Between the prisoner and the visitor, there used to be a screen and glass, and the conversation was done through an intercom. Correctional officers monitored the conversations the majority of the time. Alcatraz Captain Phil Burgeon stated that they didn't always have time to monitor every single one of the conversations, but the vast majority of visits were closely tracked. If a prisoner didn't follow the rules, he wouldn't be allowed any more visitors. Simple as that. Mealtime was a whole process at Alcatraz. A whistle system indicated which block and tier of men would move in and out of the dining hall. The whistle also indicated who sat where, where to place hands, and when to start eating. Each dining table had benches that held up to six men. 
Although smaller tables that seated four later replaced these benches, reportedly the food served at Alcatraz was the best in the United States prison system. So that's one nice surprise. A breakfast menu is actually still preserved on the hallway board at Alcatraz dated March 21st, 1963. The breakfast menu included assorted dry cereals, steamed whole wheat, scrambled eggs, milk, fruit, toast, bread, and butter. Inmates were permitted to eat as much as they liked within 20 minutes, provided that they didn't leave anything to waste. Waste would be reported, and if it happened often, inmates would lose different privileges. All of the prison population, including the guards and officials, would all eat together, with the dining hall being able to accommodate over 250 people. The recreation yard was the yard used by inmates. It's basically the most freedom inmates were allowed to have in the prison, but of course, they're still under constant supervision. Inmates were permitted out into the yard on Saturdays and Sundays and on holidays for a maximum of five hours. Those who worked seven days a week in the kitchen were rewarded with short yard breaks during the weekdays as well. Many of the inmates used weekends in the yards to catch up with each other and talk and scheme about whatever. It was the only real opportunity they had during the week for a quality conversation. And yep, you guessed it, it badly behaved prisoners had their yard access rights taken away from them on weekends. The yard was big enough for the inmates to play games such as baseball, softball, and other sports. Because of the small size of the yard and the diamond at the end of it, a section of the wall behind first base was actually padded to cushion the impact of inmates overrunning it. You would think that gloves, bats, and balls would be considered dangerous, but apparently it wasn't. Alcatraz gained notoriety right from the beginning as the toughest prison in America. Former prisoners reported that Alcatraz tested their sanity with lengthy, solitary confinements being one of the worst forms of punishment. Was it true that inmates were locked in dungeons for punishment? Well, sort of. Remember, the cell house had been built on top of a 19th century fortress that was used by the US military to protect the bay. Below A block actually was a set of cells that were known as the Spanish Dungeon. These cells had been used during the military prison era. In the late 1930s, supposedly, the dungeon cells were occasionally used for unmanageable inmates. Many correctional officers have agreed that they had heard of or were aware that some extremely unmanageable inmates were handcuffed to bars in the dungeons for short periods of time. The prison's reputation wasn't helped by the arrival of more of America's most dangerous felons, including Robert Stroud, the Birdman of Alcatraz in 1942. He entered the prison system at age 19 and never left, spending 17 years at Alcatraz. One writer called Alcatraz as, quote, the great garbage can of San Francisco Bay into which every federal prison dumped its most rotten apples. However, despite its reputation, some prisoners reported that the living conditions there were much better than most other prisons in the country, especially the food. The truth is, Alcatraz was fine if you behaved. If not, then it's basically as bad as it can get. The discipline dished out at Alcatraz was probably as severe as it could have possibly been back then. The most common complaint was the rule of silence, which was discontinued in the late 1930s. In the earlier years of Alcatraz, inmates were supposed to be absolutely silent except during meals and recreation periods. The silence rule was considered harsh and inmates were disciplined for even minor violations of the rule. It was so bad that some inmates commonly emptied out water from their toilets and created a primitive communication system through the sewage piping. What were the good things about Alcatraz? According to former inmate Willie Radke, it was actually a great advantage having your own cell. By having your own cell, it kept you safe from other inmates, and there was still a little bit of privacy. He also stated that the staff treated the inmates respectfully, although they rarely spoke to each other. While Alcatraz certainly wasn't St. Regis, its tough-as-nails reputation was a bit of a Hollywood creation. Alcatraz's first warden, James A. Johnson, knew poor food was often the cause of prison riots, so he prided himself on serving good food to the inmates. And that's why inmates essentially had an all-you-can-eat-with-no-waste policy. Overall, some prisoners considered the conditions inside Alcatraz to be more attractive than at other federal prisons, and many inmates actually asked to be transferred to Alcatraz. Inmates who behaved had access to privileges that included monthly movies and books. The prison has its own library with over 15,000 books and a lot of popular magazine subscriptions. Inmates would place orders by putting a slip with their card in a box to the entrance of the dining hall before breakfast, and the books would be delivered to and from their cell by a librarian. Books and magazines were carefully curated. Anything crime-related were torn out of magazines and newspapers were actually banned. Alcatraz went from a place where inmates couldn't talk to a prison where there's a music hour. Every night, inmates could play a stringed instrument from 5.30 to 7. Alcatraz also allowed prison bands, and they practiced in the dining room or auditorium during music hour. 
Al Capone famously practiced playing his banjo in his cell. Capone was imprisoned for tax evasion and arrived at Alcatraz in 1934 as convict number 85. He became a cooperative prisoner and that's why he was allowed to play in the prison band. The Rock Islanders would play Sunday night concerts for the other inmates, but that band ended when Capone got into a fight with the saxophone player. Convicts weren't the only ones living on the island. The guards and their families lived there too. At any given time, there were around 300 civilians living on Alcatraz that included both women and children. Families of the guards enjoyed their own bowling alley, small convenience store, and soda fountain shop. Families did most of their shopping on the mainland since the prison boat made 12 scheduled runs to the Van Ness Street Pier each day. The warden lived in a large house adjacent to the cell house and actually had inmates with good conduct records come over and cook and clean. Kids that lived on the island took a ferry to school every day. Nothing was produced or grown on the island, so a boat ride was required for anything on the island. So why did Alcatraz shut down? Basically, it was just too expensive to house the inmates. Operationally, Alcatraz was the most expensive prison of any state or federal institution. It was determined that other institutions could serve the same purpose for less cost. Watch this next video to find out about the untold truth about the escape from Alcatraz.